my name is Dr. Heather Katz. I am an assistant professor of political science here at SWASU, and I specialize in international relations. My name is Dawson. I'm the social sciences teaching assistant at SWASU. Um, I'm planning on going to grad school studying Russian labor history. My name is Samantha Cowan. I am a double major in political science and psychology, and I am currently the psychology stats TA and tutor, and I intend to go to law school and just have taken a lot of Dr. Katz classes, so. <laughs> or more. Um, so we were talking about um, how social media has affected the perception of Ukraine and Russia. So Rus Putin has been trying to really control the story, control the narrative of um, Russian action in the Ukraine, saving tr people who are truly Russian more than Western. But that has not panned out. And so when you go on social media, say TikTok or uh, YouTube or, and other um, pretty big platforms, what we've noticed is that there's a lot of fun, um, how should I put this? There's a lot of fun um, comeuppance for, for Putin and for the Russians. So can you guys think of any in particular? In social media examples? Oh, like what we've seen so far in social media that um, is kind of painting the Ukrainians as like heroes against a big bad villain. Well, the Ukrainians did post a tweet uh, that said, tag Russia and let us know what you think of them. Uh, <laughs> there's, there's, a, there's a whole new front to this war of, of social media in Twitter and TikTok and Reddit, uh, where the, idea, the idea, ideology of this war is a clear Ukrainian advantage. Right. And so Putin um, has experimented in the past with ways to shut down the Russian internet and create his own Russian intranet. Um, and so he's trying to do some of that in the Ukraine. Um, you can destroy internet infrastructure and make it very hard for people to go online, but so far he has not been successful. Um, one of the TikToks, I, I, I hate to admit that as, as a professor I'm a little bit addicted to TikTok. I saw yesterday a uh, Ukrainian tractor pulling a um, Russian missile launcher of some kind. And Dawson, what did you say that the government declared about that? Yeah, the Ukrainian government said that uh, you're all stolen Russian military uh, property when you file your property taxes, that does not need to count as personal income. The, U the Ukrainian government, in the most hilarious way possible, is promoting the theft of Russian military vehicles. And it's pretty apparent that Russian soldiers aren't really, oh, well, some of them anyway, aren't really sure why they're there. Some of them, at least through social media, we've learned that they think they've been lied to um, and are pretty much dropping their weapons and saying, forget it. Um, and so social, the social media, the, the part of the war that's taking place in the public view is really just fun. Um, I can't remember a time in my studies and researching recent history and through the lens of politics where it's pretty clear there's a good guy and a bad guy. Um, and Putin, as much as he would like to believe he's the savior of the greatness of Russia, is just... Uh, no, no one's buying it. I think. Oh, oh sorry. you go ahead. You go ahead. <laughs> I think playing off of the idea of like there is clearly a good and bad guy. Like my TikTok, I don't think is as fun and happy-go-lucky as what y'all are watching. <laughs> but I think a lot of the optics shows that like Ukrainian suffering. I've seen TikToks of teachers sobbing, having to hold guns to protect their countries as their students are probably fleeing the country mm -hmm. and it's just showing how this is affecting real people this is showing that this is a serious event and I think like this is the optics of social media is helping the West and the whole rest of the world fight against Russian propaganda that this is their fight this is for a good cause when in reality it isn't so so much of social media is um, criticized through the lens of how it's manipulated people's opinions. But here we see um, one of the things that I've always argued, that technology and the internet and social media is a tool. It can be used for good and used for ill. And so, yeah, I've seen some of that, but certainly the tractor stealing a missile launcher is a little bit more fun. But there was also uh, one I came across about a Russian citizen uh, talking about the propaganda that they see uh, through the Russian 
controlled media. And so they know they're being lied to. Yeah. So, it, you know, it's quite a powerful tool. Putin, Putin is definitely playing by an old rule book here. We're, we're seeing probably the first example of a real 21st century conflict, how things will look moving forward. Where the tw in the 20th century, the groundbreaking uh, item of war was the fact that there were TV cameras showing everything, so the gruesome reality of, of war from a distance was being shown. But as we've discussed plentifully now, now in the 21st century, we can see a Ukrainian farmer pointing a phone at himself, giggling with a, with a Russian tank being towed behind him. Right. Uh, where Putin still wants to try and keep old narratives alive, the old narrative of autocracy and controlling what people see, and the old narrative of, uh, of 20th century, century nationalism, where the eastern part of Ukraine was at one point ethnically Russian, but after 30 years of ind independence, they, they consider themselves more than ever to be Ukrainian. And now with this social media tied in Ukraine's favor, uh, the, the bonds of nationalism in Ukraine uh, have never been stronger. So again, I want to reiterate that social media it can be used as a tool for good or ill. So I don't know if Putin, Putin has certainly um, seen the power of social media in other contexts um, and has been able to manipulate opinion in many countries uh, through the use of bots and through the use of um, the Internet Research Agency, his own, what we presume is an organization that he, he controls, at least indirectly. Um, so he knows, but he's losing. I think that's, and it, it's going to take a lot for him to sort of be able to turn the narrative around. So I keep guiding this conversation. But did anyone have something to add until, or uh, we could jump to the next topic? I think we're good. All right. <laughs> so we were also asked to address how this might affect Oklahomans and Weatherfordians. Um, and so I think. Uh, well, let, let somebody else talk. I mean, oh, oh you, you go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Don't mean to steal the spotlight now. Oh, okay, yeah. um, I remember talking about gas prices right. the, the other day, and I think we can all feel the hurt of that, and I feel like in Oklahoma that's especially something that affects people. I mean, especially with farming and just commuting, and even for Weatherford students, college students, I mean, this is a commuting town. You can feel the hurt of having to pay higher gas prices because of this conflict. Mm -hmm. And I think another interesting direction that was taken by um, is Goodyear is the current? Correct. Still, that's how you pronounce it. Okay. The current General uh, Assembly Leader. Uh, oh, Secretary Assembly, General. Secretary General. That's what it is. <laughs> okay. Tony Gutierrez um, from the United Nations actually addressed something really interesting in regards to climate change, saying that now above all times is the time to reconsider our use of fossil fuels because how volatile the market can be in response to conflicts like this, and most likely renewable energy will not be as reactive, especially in the marketplace. Mm. Yeah. Fossil fuels are a world that uh, a market that Russia rules. Uh, the, a great way to take them down a peg would be to find a different way to go about your commute, go about your your job farming. Well, meanwhile, there is a look now, a new look at some of the destruction that is happening in Kiev. Aerial footage showing the city. Uh, parts of it just uh, destroyed from some of the shelling. And many residents are having, obviously, to leave town. Look at these apartment buildings. It's unbelievable. And so this morning we're told that frequent shelling has been heard, although more distant in recent days. Uh, the loud thudding that can be hear heard, the air raid sirens that go off almost on a minute-by-minute -minute basis. Vladimir Putin is trying to control the talking points, banning media outlets from using the term war when talking about the ongoing attacks. At least two independent Russian news outlets that refuse to share his talking points have been forced off the air this morning. And in an effort to intimidate journalists, the Russian uh, parliament has just passed a new rule that uh, basically puts a 15-year prison sentence on anyone who reports, quote, fake news. And I'm sure living in the United States, there's a lot of people who might be watching this who really want to get involved with this conflict. Uh, and, and there are several ways that, that 
people in this area can really make a difference. One of those ways is not to send in an organized military force. We're still playing by Cold War rules. Uh, it is not a good idea to send large swaths of, of troops over to Ukraine. Uh, that being said, there are ways that the international community is instituting sanctions and crashing Russia's already vulnerable economy. This is already paying off in dividends and, and changing the Russian perception of the reality of this war. Going off of that, I'm, <coughs> sanctions tend to hurt the people before it hurts anyone in power. Yes. And so right now Russians, even though we want to see them as the enemy, they're still people, they're still being hurt by this as well. And most of the time, and currently in this conflict, they're not exactly supportive of what's going on. Yes. So we need to keep in mind of how this is hurting them, how Ukrainians are being hurt by this. They're literally leaving in droves. 600,000 people have left the country and are being displaced. Places like Poland and other countries are taking refugees in the thousands. And this could even melt off here and have our own refugee crisis, which is not particularly popular in terms of political things. but. We need to also keep in mind that people outside of the United States are suffering. And there are ways we can help them. And there yeah. are a lot of credible NGOs like the Red Cross that we can be utilizing to donate to. Um, you can actually directly donate to the Ukrainian military through their website. Um, there are actually freedom of information organizations called, I can't remember it right now, but it's something in Russia but it helps with helping them have access to free and accessible and real news sources. And I just think we need to remember that we're not the only ones that are being hurt by this. So financially, I, I think Oklahomans um, should be aware of this. Um, certainly, we could argue that refugees may be uh, something that we see in the United States, but also, a positive spin um, is that democracy is being defended. Um, that uh, we had the State of the Union last night, and um, generally Biden got pretty bipartisan applause. Um, and so, in a way, it's taking our differences, which are significant and, and worthy of discussion in another uh, context, but it's taking those problems and putting them to the, to the side and deciding what's really important, and the protection of, of sovereignty, of self-determination, of the people to be ch people to be able to choose to be free. That's something that all Americans can agree on, and something that um, pretty much everyone except Putin agrees on too. <laughs> Just I would like to read from the screenshot of the. Smartphone of a smartphone of, uh, of a killed Russian soldier. That's an actual screenshot from someone who is dead already. Lyosh, how are you doing? Why has it been so long since you responded? Are you really? In, during, in training exercises, asks the mother of the killed the soldier moments before he was killed. Mama, I'm no longer in Crimea. I'm not in training sessions. Where are you then? Papa is asking whether I can send you a parcel. What kind of a parcel, Mama, can you send me? What are you talking about? What happened? Mama, I'm in Ukraine. There is a real war raging here. I'm afraid. We are bombing all of the cities together, even, even targeting civilians. We were told that they would welcome us. And they are falling under our armored vehicles, throwing themselves under the wheels and not allowing us to pass. They call us fascists. Mama, this is so hard. And this was several moments before he was killed. In closing, for me, 
Um, it's hard to know what to expect next. Uh, certainly there is an um, image of Putin who has been painted into a corner, and I feel like he cannot simply give up, nor can he really perceive horrid in a successful way. So there's really, it's hard to say how this will end. Um, but I am pretty certain that, at least at the minimum, people are concerned about a, a third world war and nuclear weapons. I don't foresee that. Um, so at, at least we can take comfort in that, um, that as irrational as sometimes Putin may seem, he still wants to live, wants to make sure Russia um, survives this conflict, and, wants, and his ultimate goal of being remembered well through history is not going to be met by starting a, a nuclear exchange. So at least there's, it's hard to know again what's going to come next, but I, I think that's pretty clear. For me, this is a, a reminder of a David and Goliath type of story with bigger nations picking on smaller nations and the brutal reality of what those smaller nations have to deal with. This is a better example than any in history of what things look like from the smaller nation's perspective. Now that the smaller nation is equipped with pocket devices that can capture the entire thing and send it to the eyes of the entire world. Moving forward, I think that, I, I think that people in Russia, in any larger power, such as the United States or China, should try and embrace policies that lead to peace and embrace policies that leave them not picking on smaller powers. And for me, I think we can all agree that this is a very unprecedented event. And then we've been filled in the past two years with unprecedented events. I think right now it's easy to feel hopeless and feel like you can't have a voice or you don't have the power to affect change. But I think we need to realize that there are ways we can help. We can donate. We can use our time. We can donate our, our time. We can donate food, clothing, all the things that you think you would need. In addition, educate yourself. Boost the voices of people that need them the most now. I think in the United States we can feel removed from these places and we can feel like we can shift the blame. But I think through social media and other avenues we have a lot of power. So don't forget the power that you have as a person. <laughs>